that. I mean, it's a controversial uh, treatment that really doesn't have any research that supports it. Um, so, you know, I'm, that's all I can say about it, really. You know, I would like to say that I, that I read that book, uh, The Brain That Changes Itself. Have you read that one? No, but neuroplasticity is, yeah. you know. And it was just like a an amazing book, and so it kind of gives you hope for the future as far as... Yeah. You know, as well, that, as I think that the reason that Cognet can be, can, can, can be, uh, can be useful, as well as any number of things, the benefit strategies that, that Ray mentioned, is because our brains, um, we have the gift of neuroplasticity, which means that when certain kinds of uh, activities are targeted, um, and we have targeted practice, um, it, it can change the nature of our neurocircuitry, um, which is why we can do reading interventions and um, other things like that, which is why learning education works. So, yeah, I guess so. We're practicing a lot, you learn to play tennis better or any of those things. So. My question maybe is a little bit of a follow-up to that. And if um, you know, the brain is changing, should neuropsychological testing be repeated if it's been done, say, in elementary school? Uh, is there, you know, uh, is it only if you think something has changed and are there certain parameters that you look at to determine whether that should happen? Or should it just be every so many years or elementary, junior high, senior high uh, to better scale uh, learning um, strategies for an individual child? Well, I think, I think things can change over the years, and especially, um, I've certainly seen it numerous times where I've seen somebody when they were seven or eight, and then I've seen them at 15, and things look different. I mean, things that can change most often, it's been my experience, are the verbal areas. And so the more, if a kid has a reading disorder, and, you know, it's hard to correct it, and then you, you test them at age eight, and their verbal abilities look okay, and then you can, test, you can test them at age 16 or 17 and there may be some gaps. The, the scores may have fallen because they haven't read as much or haven't been as academically engaged. Of course, if they have you know, injury or illness, that can affect, that can create changes too. But I, you know, I think especially if you had neuropsych testing that was real in-depth neuropsych testing, I think you would see changes you know, over time. Things would change. It may not be so dramatic that you would change any interventions or things you were doing, but things can change for sure. I, I see it mostly on the verbal, verbal scales. <clears throat> One of the things that you pointed out was having students uh, use typing skills to increase what they're getting active reading strategy. Uh, kids with HD hate typing programs. They're boring. How do you get them to learn the automaticity as a trick early so I don't have to try to beat them into it in the ninth grade, he's in fourth grade. <laughs> well, that's a hard one. Uh, and again, Ellen, you might, I don't want to give that much to you. But one thing you can do, of course, is, is just sign them up in classes where they absolutely have to do it you know that'd be one way where it's and it's if it's a fun class and or using uh you know there's there's some pretty fun typing games out yeah. there that they could that they could learn to do the routine things on like native speaking and i'm sure there's other more yeah the, i uh, i haven't uh, i would recommend getting a typing program that has a very strong video game component you know where you can explode letters by typing on the key and fun things like that. And, uh, you know, that, that, that could help. Um, and then there's also driving naturally speaking or basically a voice recognition program where you can speak and not type. Because typing can be slow too and that can slow you down. 
And I mean, it might be boring at first learning the dragon naturally speaking, but it can be affecting after a while, don't you think? Oh, it goes really fast. I mean, it's so good now that it takes a very small amount of time to train it with accuracy. So, yeah, it used to be it was a bit hassle, but it's really wonderful now. Is it possible that um, a child could have, I guess, slow working memory process or working memory and processing speed in just um, academic and not physical activities? Like in problem solving and like sports and stuff, if they're, I mean, extremely wonderful at that, when you get to the academic side, I mean, it's, it's tough. I see it all the time, and it's confusing, but I see it all the time. Our kids okay. are great. So that doesn't mean that there is an issue if, you know. Yeah, I mean, I see kids who are, they say, well, they're a great athlete, and they play a fast sport, too. You know, and I'm thinking, how could that be, you know? And yet, that's the way it is. They, they are very slow at processing letters and numbers and um, anything on the printed page. So, so okay. that's still real, that they still have a real processing issue? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And I don't know all the neurology behind it, the neuropsychology behind it, but yes, I see it all the time, where they're going to be real fast, even socially quick. So. I'm having some trouble in my mind reconciling um, and have for years, as much as this presentation and like that, accommodations which involve shortening homework or uh, you know, reducing stress on the child with increased practice, more drilling, more practice. Now you could make a distinction between like drilling things like math facts and doing other more complex tasks, shortening those up. But wouldn't trying to do complex tasks help train your working memory as well? Um, it, it, you know, in my experience, it, it, there's a real trade-off between limiting how much homework there is and, um, extra, I mean, there's a trade-off, extra practice to wear out the kid and be stressed out and anxious, but limiting the homework may mean that they never get enough practice to I, I really um, memorize and learn in, in an automatic, overlearn in it or make it automatic. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, well, I, I'll try, I'll give you my response. Um, actually, homework is sort of controversial. Um, there, I've been recently, recently reading research about homework and homework practices and so on. And uh, some, there's, there's, there's a real point of diminishing return with homework, you know, um, so that, and to the extent that it's useful, it needs to be useful it, um, it needs to be very much independent practice that the student just, you know, to keep the student um, aware of and practiced in things that they've done previously. So, uh, why, so I think it depends very much on the type of homework that you're talking about in terms of reducing, um, you know, if it's a page of problem after problem after problem, there, uh, there's uh, that, there, that that may not be particularly useful. On the other hand, uh, if it's reading, um, you know, if you're practicing reading, then reading widely and reading orally with somebody there to give you words you don't know or explain meanings or something may be a wonderful thing to do. So I think really, it really depends. I I. Uh, I personally think reducing homework when it's when someone when a child is working really hard, and it's not a question of goofing off or something, and it's just taking a really long time. I think that's uh, I I well uh, I don't like that, and I think I think kids ought to have a limited amount of, amount of homework so they have time to do other things besides you know. 50 math problems and things, so that's all.
think you, you may have other things to say. About no, I, I agree, and I think that um, you have to think about the other, the other uh, impact that slogging through homework every night has on their attitude towards achievement and school and the long, the long range. Yeah, I guess that's it then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.